Okay, so we're going to be talking about inflammatory and infectious disorders of the female reproductive tract. When we think about inflammatory and infectious uh, disorders, um, they are very common in places like the vagina, the cervix, the fallopian tubes, and also in the adjacent areas. There are some common organisms that cause uh, infections or inflammatory disorders, and they include uh, bacteria, viruses, things like that. Some um, other common causes include uh, certain medications, birth control pills, antibiotics, stress, douching, again, douching too much, again, changes that normal flora, and we've already discussed what, the nor what normal flora is and why it's important. So again, douching can be a cause. Aging, okay. Infections are introduced by such measures as using unclean douche nozzles, poor hygiene, poor hand washing, poor nail care, uh, soiled clothing, and also intercourse can lead to some of these disorders. So we're going to start off talking about simple vaginitis. When you think about simple vaginitis, it's plain and simple an inflammation of the vagina. Okay, so there is inflammation of the vagina with simple vaginitis. The patho, uh, it, is, uh, it is a common vaginal infection. Some of the organisms uh, that cause simple vaginitis can be anything from E. coli to staph, strep can cause it, uh, T. vaginalis, which is a, a protozoan a parasite, uh, C. albicans can cause it, which is a yeast, okay, so different things like that. Now with vaginitis, it is an inflammation of the vagina. It can again be due to infrequent pad or tampon changes and that causes irritation and that creates a medium for organism growth. Now with T. vaginalis, um, it causes a profuse, uh, kind of like a foamy, bubbly drainage, like exudate on the vaginal walls. Uh, then with C. albicans, it can cause a like thick, cheesy-like discharge to occur. And bacterial vaginitis presents itself um, by causing a malodorous, kind of milky discharge. So what are my clinical manifestations of simple vaginitis? Well, it can be anything from yellow, white, uh, grayish white, or a curd-like discharge. There is pruritus and vaginal burning. There is edema in the surrounding tissue. Voiding and defecation will intensify these symptoms. That's quite painful. During my assessment subjectively, I'm going to do a menstrual history. I want to know the age at menarche. Uh, what is the cycle length, the duration, and the nature of the flow, uh, birth control methods, any medications they are on, is there a family history of diabetes, are there previous vaginal infections, STIs. Also ask about sexual practices and signs of infection in their sex partner. Uh, dysuria is also something that can occur. Objectively, I'm going to observe the skin. Um, it's going to be excoriated due to the pruritus and the scratching, and that can lead to possible secondary infections. Once you scratch and open up, um, open up the skin, they can also have a secondary infection on top of uh, the primary one associated with simple vaginitis. So we have to be very careful about scratching the skin and causing secondary infections. I'm going to observe the type of drainage. Diagnostic tests, um, they can do a direct visual exam of the vagina. They're going to do cultures. They might do what is called a bimanual exam to assess for vaginal inflammation. Um, a bimanual exam is when the healthcare practitioner inserts two fingers into the vagina, and what they're doing uh, is they're palpating the cervix. So that is what a bimanual exam is. Two fingers are placed in the vagina to palpate the cervix, plain and simple. Medical management treatment goals are to cure the infection. We want to prevent reinfection. We want to prevent complications. We want to prevent infection of their sex partner or partners. Uh, douching may be prescribed at times. Uh, local applications of vaginal suppositories, ointments, and creams. Advise the patient to use their medications at bedtime and the fact that they need to uh, remain in a lying position. They need to lay down for about 30 minutes or so after they insert the medication to allow for it to absorb 
and to prevent the medication uh, from being uh, lost out of the vagina because if they if they insert the medication and jump up it's all going to come out so it's very important that they need to lay down for about 30 minutes oral medications may be needed the patient should refrain from sex or request that their partner wear a condom nursing interventions and patient teaching emphasize the importance of hand washing both before and after medication application so washing their hands is extremely important both before um, they place medications into the vagina and also after they place the medications in the vagina. Uh, heat from douching, this is why uh, sometimes they, the physician may prescribe uh, some douching but it'll be very minimal douching. Uh, so the heat from douching, uh, perineal irrigations or sitz baths, they are very helpful to help decrease the discomfort associated with simple vaginitis. Now, we know on the flip side, douching too frequently can alter the vagina's normal flora. So that's not a good thing. So we will discourage douching unless it is prescribed by the healthcare practitioner, okay? Uh, abstain from sex during treatment. The partner should use a condom until the infection is resolved. Again, sexual partners should also be treated. Now, moving on to senile vaginitis, also known as atrophic vaginitis. This is commonly seen after menopause, okay? So with the senile vaginitis, just think about this is occurring uh, most usually after menopause. Uh, this is where the vaginal lining starts to thin, okay? So we have thinning of the vaginal lining. Now, low estrogen levels, again, this is why this is commonly seen after menopause. Low estrogen levels uh, lead to the vulva and the vaginal thinning. Um, it also causes atrophy where these waste away. There is bacterial invasion susceptibility when you have uh, the vulva and the vaginal lining uh, wasting away. You have a better um, probability of bacteria invading in those areas. Uh, the exudate causes the pruritus, the edema, and the skin irritation. Treatment includes estrogen, uh, vaginal suppositories, ointments. All right, moving on to cervicitis. Cervicitis uh, is inflammation. Sometimes you will also see this referred to as an infection. So infl inflammation, infection of the cervix. Uh, it is linked to STIs such as chlamydia, uh, gonorrhea, HPV, uh, trichomoniasis, which is a protozoan-type parasite. Uh, also, bacteria like staph and strep can also lead to cervicitis. Other causes include things like cervical caps, okay? And I've placed a picture um, on here about these uh, different types of barriers. So cervical caps is just a, a barrier contraceptive. I've also had pictures on here of diaphragms for you to look at. Um, Pessary devices can also lead to cervicitis. What a pessary device does is it's used to treat a pelvic organ prolapse. So when the pelvic organs are prolapsing and moving downward, this is where you would see a pessary device used. And I have a picture of it that I have placed uh, on the slides for you to look at. And we'll talk more about this a little bit later. Uh, it also can be due to allergic reactions to condoms, uh, douching, certain spermicides. Also, risky behavior, like multiple sex partners, a history of STIs. If you've had intercourse at an early age, it predisposes you to cervicitis. Some of the symptoms associated with cervicitis includes dyspareunia, again, which means painful sex, uh, vaginal pain, pelvic heaviness, abnormal vaginal bleeding, and also they can have like a gray, uh, whitish to yellowish discharge. If left untreated, it can spread to other pelvic organs. Personal hygiene and warm tub baths uh, can help decrease uh, some of the odor and discomfort associated with cervicitis. Vaginal suppositories, ointments, uh, creams are prescribed. Some of the drug therapy includes things like azithromycin, which is an antibiotic. Uh, doxycycline, which is also an antibiotic, may also be prescribed. And again, the partner should also be treated as well. So with these infections that we're talking about, remember, it is always important for the partner to be treated as well. 
Now we're going to talk about pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. Okay, so when we're talking about PID, this is um, an infection, an inflammation, okay, of the cervix, the uterus, uh, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. And this has extended out into the connective tissues. So when we think about some of the most common causative organisms of PID, they include things like uh, staph, strep, chlamydia, which we'll talk about later, gonorrhea, we'll talk about that again later, uh, the uh, tubercle bacilli, which is the bacteria that causes tuberculosis, okay, that's also a causative factor. So those are just some of the um, organisms that can lead to PID. And again, it's just an infection slash, uh, slash inflammation of the cervix, the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries, and that has extended out into the connective tissues. Now, PID can also be uh, caused by the insertion of instruments. Uh, it can be uh, caused by catheters. Uh, abortions can cause it. Pelvic surgeries can lead to it. Now, when conditions or procedures alter or destroy the cervical mucus, this is going to allow bacteria to ascend up into the uterine cavity. This can lead to adhesions. Remember, adhesions uh, are just scar tissue. Okay, so this can lead to adhesions and then ultimately it can also lead to sterility. So the, the woman can actually become sterile from PID. Now, sexually active women who have more than one partner are at much more higher risk for PID. Now, to add to your notes, there are also some other things that PID can lead to, and they include the following. PID can lead to abscesses, ectopic pregnancy, and chronic pelvic pain. Again, so PID can also lead to abscesses, ectopic pregnancy, and chronic pelvic pain. Okay, and remember, if you don't know what something is, look it up and research it. Because what you research, you remember. So instead of asking a question automatically, if you don't know something, what is this? Look it up. Okay? That's exactly what we had to do when I was in nursing school, and we did not have the internet to do it by. You had to get in your Mosby's Dictionary and look things up. So Google things, research it, so that helps to build your knowledge bank, which will serve you well when you take your NCLEX. All right, so clinical manifestations of PID. This is extremely important that you know the clinical manifestations associated with pelvic inflammatory disease. So PID, what are my clinical manifestations? I better know these. Fever and chills. Okay, so fever and chills. Severe abdominal pain. And also add to that pelvic pain if your book does not say that. So severe abdominal pain, pelvic pain, malaise, nausea and vomiting. They have a malodorous, purulent vaginal exudate that occurs. So that drainage is going to be uh, very malodorous and it's going to be purulent. What does purulent mean? It means it looks like pus. All right, so again, what are my clinical manifestations of PID? I have fever and chills, severe abdominal pain, and pelvic pain, malaise, nausea and vomiting, a malodorous, purulent, vaginal exudate or drainage, okay? So during my assessment subjectively, I'm going to assess for pain. I'm going to ask questions about that. I'm going to do a sexual history. I'm going to, uh, the patient's going to have a pelvic exam. Uh, the pelvic procedure, uh, they have got to do a pelvic exam because we have got to determine uh, they're going to have to get, um, they're going to have to get culture, they're going to have to do a culture and sensitivity to determine the pathogen that is causing the PID. Okay, the patient may complain of lower abdominal and pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, which means pain with menstruation, we already know that, dysuria, so painful urination, and then the vulvar pruritus. So the vulva is uh, very itchy. Okay, and again, remember they scratch it a lot and that leads to the possibility of secondary infections that we already talked about. Um, objectively, okay, I'm going to assess for things like fever, chills, 
I'm going to assess for the amount and the characteristics of the vaginal discharge because I have to document on that. Again, the discharge uh, is purulent to, uh, purulent to thin, and it can also be mucoid. Mucoid means that it's like mucus. Okay. Diagnostic tests, uh, they're going to do gram stains of the secretions. They're going to do a CNS, a culture and sensitivity, again, because we have to identify the organism so the patient can be placed on the proper antibiotic treatment. Ultrasounds, MRIs may be done. They may do a vaginal ultrasound. Uh, they're going to draw labs. It's going to uh, show an elevation in leukocytes. Okay, so our WBCs are going to be jacked up. Also, uh, ESR, we already talked about ESR in one of the earlier chapters, that uh, erythrocyte sed rate, that is increased. And we know anytime an ESR is increased, that is telling me something about inf inflammation in my patient. So an elevated ESR equals inflammation. Also, uh, CRP, the C-reactive protein, that is elevated, and that too indicates inflammation. These are two labs we've already talked about in the musculoskeletal chapter, the ESR and the CRP. Those both are indicative of inflammation in my patient. Now, medical management. The goal is to try to control and, of course, eradicate the infection. And we need to make sure that we are preventing the spread to others. So we've got to do education. Systemic antibiotics, uh, it might be IV, it might be IM, just follow your orders. Um, some of the drugs that you might see it treated with include uh, doxycycline, things like that. Those are just antibiotics. Now, the patient must refrain from sex during the entire course of the treatment. The partner must be examined and treated also. Uh, pain control, rest, adequate fluid intake is important. Uh, corticosteroids may, uh, might also be administered. Uh, and that will help to improve the chances of the patient remaining fertile. Again, because like we said, PID can lead to sterility in women. Um, nursing intervention, interventions and patient teaching. Uh, the patient is hospitalized usually to try to isolate the organism and initiate the treatment plan. Follow precautions of your hospital. Uh, don goggles if splashing is possible. Nursing interventions include assessing for pain, administering your analgesics as ordered, and as needed, monitor your vital signs and uh, treatment progress, fluids to prevent dehydration, comfort measures include things like bathing, changing those perineal pads frequently, personal hygiene frequently, and also warm douches may be prescribed. But we only do the warm douches if they are prescribed. We don't want to alternate, excuse me, we do not want to um, mess up that normal flora. Okay, that is located uh, in the vagina. So again, douching too much is a bad thing. But if the healthcare practitioner prescribes douching, of course, you follow those orders. But we do not want alteration of the normal flora. Uh, display a positive non-judgmental attitude. Uh, place the patient in a Fowler's position to promote drainage. Education includes the following. Discuss signs and symptoms to report. Medication therapy. Personal hygiene to decrease infection, like proper hand washing, and also avoiding the use of tampons. Now again, something very important that you've got to make sure you remember. PID can cause infertility due to the scarring which blocks the fallopian tubes. PID is the most common complication uh, that's associated when we think about PID. PID's most common complication is sterility. So PID can lead to sterility. So I want to make sure that you understand that and how PID leads to sterility. How does it do it? It's due to the scarring. That scarring blocks the fallopian tube. And PID, one of the most common complications associated with PID is sterility. Very important for you to remember. Now, you have some patient problems that you need to uh, make sure that you look at. Again, you know the importance of always looking, looking at these because they contain some really good information and it kind of summarizes everything that we've talked about. So make sure you look at those. Um, I see that you have, let's see, 
you have, uh, let's see, only two. So you have recent onset of pain and then you have impaired health maintenance related to insufficient knowledge of condition and complications. So make sure you read through your nursing interventions associated with that. All right, moving on to toxic shock syndrome, TSS. All right, one thing that we need to understand with a TSS, and this is just FYI, you do not have to write all this down. I just want you to understand something. TSS does not only occur in women. TSS can occur in men and children, okay? And it happens when bacteria enters through an opening in the skin. Uh, bacteria like strep and staph, uh, they produce toxins okay, called TSS, uh, which is considered to be what they call a super antigen that causes the body's immune system to overreact to that pathogen. And then the patient can go into shock and that can lead to organ failure. Okay, So when you think about TSS, yes, TSS is associated the majority of the time with tampon use and with women, but it can also occur in other uh, people as well, like children and males. So again, you do not have to memorize any of that. I just wanted you to know that. It's just an FYI thing. Now, some very important thing that you better make sure you know is coming up. So what is the patho of TSS? Well, it is an acute bacterial infection caused by Staphylococcus aureus, and that is extremely important to remember. So what is, what is it? It's an acute bacterial infection. What is it caused by? Staph. Usually occurs in women who are menstruating and using tampons. And here's coming some, up some very important information. Okay, when we say it usually occurs in women who are menstruating and using tampons, these are tampons especially that are super absorbent. So super absorbent tampons are especially associated with toxic shock syndrome. Another very important thing, if a tampon is left in place too long, bacteria begins to proliferate and uh, it releases toxins out into the bloodstream and that causes the TSS to occur. Very importantly, women at greatest risk include those who insert their tampons with their fingers instead of using an applicator, those with chronic vaginal infections, and those who have genital herpes. Again, TSS can also occur in non-menstruating women. Uh, some of your additional risk factors, if you've recently given birth, if you've had a recent surgery, if you've had internal medical packing, okay, due to some procedure and they put packing into the vagina, that is also an increased chance of TSS. So again, some of the things that we better make sure we focus on. What is the main culprit of TSS? Staph. What is something that usually leads to TSS? Using super absorbent tampons. And also if that tampon is left in place too long, that increases your chances of developing TSS. If you insert tampons with your fingers instead of an applicator, that increases your chances of TSS. Now coming up now is some extremely important information that you better make sure that you know, and that is clinical manifestations. First off, clinical, when we think about clinical manifestations, write this down. The first signs are fever and flu-like symptoms. So that is your first signs of TSS, fever, and flu-like symptoms. Extremely important for you to remember. The first signs of TSS, fever and flu-like symptoms. Okay, usually the flu-like symptoms uh, occur about in the first 24 hours. Um, and then between days two and four of menstruation, the patient may have a spike in their temperature. They might start to vomit. They develop a headache. Diarrhea can occur, hypotension. Um, myalgia, which is muscle pain. These are signs of septic shock setting in, okay? Septic shock, especially with the hypotension. We know hypotension, is that a cardinal sign of shock? Yes, it is. Increased pulse, decreased blood pressure. Okay, so my first signs of TSS, flu-like symptoms and fever. Now, some of the other clinical manifestations, they may develop a sore throat. Okay, so that's important to assess for is a sore throat, a headache. They might have a rash. 
Uh, they may have decreased urinary output. Okay, again, is that a sign of shock? Yes, it is. Decreased urinary output. They might have an increased in their B, an increased BUN. Okay, so an increased bun, and that is due to the vomiting and the dehydration. They may be disoriented related to dehydration, and also because of the release of those toxins into the bloodstream. They can have pulmonary edema. They can have inflammation of the mucous membranes that can occur. Now, during my assessment subjectively, I'm going to ask about recent use of tampons and how long was a single tampon left in place before it was changed. I'm also going to ask about if they have a sore throat, headache, fatigue, muscle pain. Objective data, I'm going to assess for things like uh, edema, rash, things like that. Diagnostic tests, there is no definitive test. Um, they can do a cervical vaginal isolate of uh, the staph. Uh, that is usually present 90% of the time. So 90% of the time it is related to staph. The other 10% of the time, what is going to be the culprit? Strep. Okay. So again, staph and strep are your culprits, and the majority of the time, which one is the main culprit? Staph. Uh, medical management, antibiotic therapy, uh, we're going to follow our culture and sensitivity results and that's what our antibiotic therapy is going to be based on are those results. IV fluids for the dehydration and all that, the vomiting. Uh, they're going to do serum blood levels to evaluate their electrolytes, checking for imbalances. Uh, also, they might do liver function tests, different things like that because again, it can spread and infect other organs. Nursing interventions and patient teaching, bed rest, antibiotic administration, monitor your vital signs and your fluid status. Oxygen may be necessary if they're in any type of respiratory distress. Advise the patient not to use super absorbent tampons. And also an important thing to teach is alternate their tampons with pad use. So they need to alternate pad and tampon use. They need to make sure that they inspect their tampon for any flaws, like shedding or flaws in that tampon. And if they see a flaw, they need to discard it. They need to change their tampon every four hours. And they need to insert it very carefully to make sure they don't uh, cause any abrasions in the vagina. They do not need to leave that tampon in for extended periods of time. Again, this is one of the main causes of TSS. So do not leave that tampon in for extended periods of time. Very important. Patients who have had TSS before should not use tampons. Instruct the patient to wash their hands thoroughly prior to insertion and then of course after insertion. Advise women who are menstruating and who develop a high fever with vomiting or diarrhea to immediately seek medical attention. And uh, first of all, before they even seek it, they better remove that tampon immediately. You don't ride to the emergency department with the tampon in. Remove it immediately. If they spike a temperature and they're on their period and they're vomiting and they have diarrhea, they need to remove that tampon immediately and get to the ED. All right, so patient problems associated with TSS. See, I think we only have one. It's inadequate fluid volume related to vomiting and diarrhea. Okay, make sure you read through your nursing interventions right there. They're extremely important. Okay, so here's some examples of what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about cervicitis. We were talking about some of the possible causes. We were talking about uh, cervical caps and diaphragms being uh, two of the possible causes of cervicitis, and these are just barrier contraceptives. So you can see that um, they differ in size when you look at the diaphragm and the cervical cap. Okay, so here we're looking at a pessary device. You have two examples here, a gel horn and a donut pessary. And what we were talking about in relation to pessary devices is that they can lead to cervicitis when we were talking about that uh, inflammation of the cervix. So this is an example of pessary devices and they are used to treat pelvic organ prolapse. So uh, what pelvic organ prolapse means is for example, when we start talking about uh, uterine prolapses, the uterus will move from its anatomical position, which you can see uh, normally how 
the uterus lies over top of the bladder, and that is actually called antiflexed. If you'll remember back from anatomy and physiology, the uterus is antiflexed uh, in the position in relation to the bladder. So that's its normal position. Uh, when you have a prolapse, that uterus will start coming down, okay, and it'll actually, it can enter into the vaginal canal, and it can actually come outside of the vaginal opening, and we'll talk more about that a little bit uh, later on in lecture. These are just examples when we are talking about uterine prolapse, and you hear the term pessary, you know what a pessary device is. And you can see right there in the box, it shows you with that donut pessary, it shows you right there where it is located in the female anatomy there. So it's holding everything up in its correct anatomical position. So that is an example of pessary devices. Now we're going to move on to disorders of the female reproductive system, and that includes endometriosis, uh, vaginal fistula, and relaxed pelvic muscles, which encompasses an array of different disorders like displaced uterus, prolapsed uterus, cystocele, urethrocele, rectocele, and enterocele. So first we're going to start off with endometriosis. So when we think about the patho of endometriosis, this is where the endometrial tissue is appearing outside of the endometrial cavity. And again, the, what are we talking about when we're talking about endometrial tissue in relation to where it's located? It is, that, it is that layer of mucous membrane that lines the uterus. And after uh, this slide, I have placed a slide on here that shows you the different layers of the uterus. So then that way you will know exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about endometrial tissue and where it is located. So endometrial tissue normally should be inside of the endometrial cavity, okay? So with endometriosis, it is now appearing outside of the uterus, outside of that endometrial cavity. So endometrial tissue uh, can be found in a different array of places. It can be found on the ovaries. It can be found on the fallopian tubes, the uterus. It can be within the abdominal cavity. It can also be located in the vagina. Now, it is thought to be spread by the lymphatic circulation. Uh, there's also theories that say it's due to menstrual backflow that occurs into the fallopian tubes uh, and into the pelvic cavity. They also believe that uh, it might be some sort of congenital displacement of the endometrial cells, which was present at birth. Now, endometrial tissue responds to normal stimulation of the ovaries. Okay, so when we think about that, you think about your endocrine system, you think about LH and FSH, and remember they are our conductors in the process of ovulation. And I'm not getting back into that. You've already had the endocrine system in A and P. If you do not remember the specifics, make sure you revisit that and refresh your memory. I'm not going to test you on it, but it, it, does, it serves you well to understand processes other than just memorizing them. So again, Endometrial tissue is responding to the normal stimulation of the ovaries. This tissue is going to bleed each month, and then it's going to form an endometrial crust that ends up causing um, an endometrial cyst. Okay, so it forms a crust, which turns into a cyst. And this cyst can actually rupture, and this produces even more endometrial tissue. Now, very, very importantly, what are my clinical manifestations that are associated with endometriosis that I better make sure that I know? First off, dysmenorrhea is the most common complaint. Okay, again, that's just the pain with menstruation. So dysmenorrhea is the most common complaint associated with endometriosis. Very, very importantly, lower abdominal and pelvic pain. Okay, with or without rectal pain. So some women complain of uh, pain in the rectal area and some do not, but that's very important to remember. So lower abdominal and pelvic pain with or without rectal pain. Uh, this pain can be unilateral or it can be bilateral. It can radiate down uh, to the lower back area, into the legs and also the groin area. And that's very important to remember. Women also can suffer from dyspareunia, so painful sex. Uh, symptoms are more acute during menstruation, and they disappear after menstruation. So that's also something that's very important to remember. So 
Again, with our clinical manifestations of endometriosis, we have lower abdominal and pelvic pain with or without rectal pain. It can be unilateral, it can be bilateral. It can radiate down into the lower back, the legs, the groin area. There's complaints also of dyspareunia. Symptoms tend to be more acute when? During menstruation. Again, and because why? Well, we already said why. Because that endometrial tissue responds to the normal stimulation of the ovaries and it's going to bleed each month. Okay, again, remember it forms a crust that ends up uh, turning into a cyst when it ruptures. It produces even more tissue. So again, very important, the symptoms are more acute during menstruation and then they disappear after menstruation. There is a higher incidence uh, of endometriosis in white women. Uh, your book talks about the ages of 25 to 35. Also, uh, higher incidences in women who have never conceived or lactated. They are also at higher risk. So I want you to look in your book uh, right there around um, the heading that says endometriosis, there is a picture right there underneath that. It's a figure. It says common sites of endometriosis. When you look at all of those dark blue spotted areas all throughout that abdominal cavity and on like the uterus, you can see it. It is on the uh, bowel there. You can see it's on the fallopian tube, the ovary. It's in all kinds of different places in this picture here. So these are all of the common areas that endometriosis can occur. So again, just take a look at that picture and you can see how widespread that endometriosis can be. So that is just a little example there for you to look at. Now, during my assessment subjectively, I'm gonna get a history of uh, symptoms from my patient. They might tell me about pelvic pain uh, during menstruation, aching, cramping maybe a bearing down sensation in their pelvis or their uh, lower back dyspareunia can occur. Uh, this type of pain may be related to the cysts that are about to rupture, or it can also be due to infected tissue, which can occur with endometriosis. The patient might tell you they have a history of menstrual irregularities, such as amenorrhea. We remember amenorrhea means an absence of a period. Now, objective data, Note your signs of abnormal uterine bleeding, okay? Infertility signs may also be evident. So endometriosis can lead to fertility issues. Diagnostic tests, um, they might do an ultrasound, uh, laparoscopy, uh, pelvic exams, things like that. Medical management, uh, briefly, we're just gonna skim through and pick out the most important things here. They may be on high dose anti-ovulatory medications which are going to inhibit ovulation and it kind of pro uh, produces or induces uh, the female into a pregnancy-like state. And that's going to suppress menstruation. Um, sometimes endometriosis disappears suddenly. Some women who become pregnant, uh, they are asymptomatic after their pregnancy and they don't ever have any other issues with endometriosis. Uh, surgery may be needed if it is a severe case. Uh, the use of lasers uh, with laparoscopy, hysterectomies, these are, these are all things that may be necessary in the medical management of endometriosis. So my nursing interventions and my patient teaching instruct on medication regimen, emphasize the importance of regular checkups, uh, the importance of reporting abnormal vaginal bleeding, encourage the patient to voice her concerns. Um, assist with comfort measures. A heating pad might be helpful. Some women have found success uh, with endometriosis by acupuncture, TENS units, yoga, okay, balanced diet and exercise may also help. Now the prognosis with endometriosis. Half of the women with endometriosis are infertile. So it is important to encourage young women to have a family early on before their condition worsens. Okay, so pregnancy and menopause, this stops the progression of endometriosis. So again, half of these women are going to be infertile. And remember which other disease process we talked about that leads to infertility. PID, remember we talked about that. Okay, so you have some patient problems that you need to look at. Uh, you have two there, pain related to displaced endometrial tissue. You have impaired sexual function related to painful intercourse or infertility. Make sure you look at your nursing interventions uh, associated with endometriosis.
All right, moving on to vaginal fistula. All right, first let's talk about the patho. What is a fistula? Okay, a fistula is an abnormal opening between two organs. So you have an abnormal opening between two organs, and that is what a fistula is. Vaginal fistulas are due to um, an ulcerating process from things like cancer, radiation can cause it, weak tissues due to pregnancies and surgeries can cause uh, vaginal fistulas. Now, vaginal fistulas are named for their organ involvement. Okay, so your book talks about something called a urethrovaginal fistula. So this is going to be an abnormal opening between, look at your word there, it's, it tells you what, where the abnormal opening is occurring between which two organs. Urethra means it's going to be an abnormal opening between the urethra and the vagina. Okay, so urethrovaginal is an opening, an abnormal opening between the urethra and the vagina. Now the next one, vesicovaginal fistula. This is an abnormal opening between the bladder and the vagina. Then you have rectovaginal fistulas. This is an abnormal opening between the rectum and the vagina. Now the clinical manifestations with uh, fistulas, um, the fistula's drainage or exudate has a distinct odor of uh, urine or feces. Usually an infection uh, in the bladder is also present. The vesicovaginal fistula is characterized by urine that's constantly trickling into the vagina. And then with a rectovaginal fistula, you have things like feces and flatus that are entering the vagina. So this is going to be very disturbing to your patient. So we have to give uh, not only you know, our physical care to our patients, but also that emotional support that they need to deal with this. Because think of, think, of, you know, think of it like this. What if this was you with this problem? It would be very embarrassing and disturbing. Okay, so during my assessment subjectively, the patient might report urine or feces uh, coming from their vagina. Objectively, the patient may exhibit stress, anxiety, pain. They might express feelings of low self-esteem due to this condition. Uh, observe their pads for urine or feces. With the diagnostic test, they can do a diagnostic test that is called uh, the methylene blue installation, and they do that into the bladder. So what they are doing, when you think about the methylene blue installation, they are doing that to check for fistulas. And what they are doing, this is just FYI, you do not have to memorize it. But what they are doing, they are instilling about two to 300 uh, milliliters in the bladder of this uh, blue dye. Okay, so they're placing it in the bladder. Then the patient places a tampon in their vagina. And then it will be checked to see if there is any dye on that tampon, which there should not be. If there is that blue dye, then that is confirmation that this patient has a fistula. Okay, so that is an example, the methylene blue installation. They might do cystoscopy, okay, to identify um, a fistula, things like that, an IV pylogram, where they use an iodine-based contrast, and then they do x-rays as it's traveling, as the dye is traveling through the kidneys, um, the ureters, and also into the bladder. Also, pelvic exams are also going to be done. Medical management, they can use these uh, glue-like sealants. Okay, they can use that to help close the fistula. They might have to do surgery. A high protein diet is recommended. We know that protein promotes healing. Dietary fiber to prevent constipation and straining. And then, of course, antibiotics. Nursing interventions, uh, the condition, again, is very disturbing for the female. Provide emotional support. Provide sits baths, deodorizing douches if ordered. Um, perineal pads and protective undergarments are important. With surgical repair, um, insertion of a Foley catheter uh, post-op is done to prevent that suture line strain that can be caused by the patient having a full bladder and we do not want any strain on that suture line uh, where the fistula was um, surgically uh, repaired. Fistulas, one thing about fistulas, sometimes they can close spontaneously. And that's what we would hope for, but that's not always the case. Now, in your book with vaginal fistulas, you have a picture at the top of the page, a figure there. And it says types of fistulas that may develop in the vagina and the uterus. So we're going to kind of look at these and understand 
where where is the tunneling or the opening between these two organs? What what where is it? Okay, let's look at the first one there at the top on the on the right. We see a uh, vesicouterine, and again that opening, that abnormal opening is going to be between the bladder and the uterus. If you want to write that over to the side there, so the vesicouterine is between the bladder and the uterus. Some of these we've already talked about. Some of these um, are not. Um, in the book uh, that they specifically talk about. All right, so the next one is vesicocervical. So that would be an abnormal opening between the bladder and the cervix. Then you go on down to vesicovaginal. Again, that's between the bladder and the vagina. The, rectovag the rectovaginal is between the rectum and the vagina. The urethrovaginal fistula is going to be between the urethra and the vagina. And then you see the last one right there. Uh, that is called a perineovaginal fistula. And this is an opening between the perineum and the vagina. So you can see that that tunneling has occurred uh, from the vagina out to the outer surface on the perineum. So that is, that is what that is when you see that tunneling right there. And it shows you all the tunneling in blue in between the two organs, okay? So that last one right there is an opening between the perineum and the vagina. So those are just some examples of fistulas. And I actually had questions on my NCLEX about fistulas, and it gave me the name. And if you don't know, um, if you do not know, if you've not learned your uh, medical terminology, it's a very good time to learn it because that can give you insight to picking a correct answer. All right, so let's talk about relaxed pelvic muscles. First, we're going to define these, what exactly they are, and look at some pictures, and then we're going to talk more in depth about each one. So with relaxed pelvic muscles, um, some, of, some of the things we're going to talk about is, number one, a displaced uterus. Okay, so a displaced uterus. So this is where the uterus has moved away from its normal position. So that's just where the uterus has moved away from its normal position. And you have a picture of the uterus in your book that was uh, toward the beginning of this chapter, that if you do not remember where the uterus lies, to go back and look at that picture, okay? And it'll show you anatomically right where it lies. Remember we said the uterus is actually considered to be anti-flexed over top of the bladder. So again, take a look at these if you do not remember where they are located. So a displaced uterus is just a uterus that's moved away from its normal position. Then we have something called a prolapsed uterus. And this is where the uterus has protruded down into the vaginal canal or beyond the vaginal opening. And whenever you have uh, the uterus that has prolapsed beyond that vaginal opening, there is a term for that called, called procedentia. And that is the term that means that the uterus has actually gone beyond the vaginal opening. It can actually hang down out of the vagina in severe cases. So again, when that happens and you have the uterus extending beyond that vaginal opening, it is called procedentia. So again, prolapsed uterus, you have a picture of this in your book. So turn to your book. Picture, there's um, pictures there that say A, B, C, and D, and it's showing you the different degrees of prolapse in that picture. It's a black and white picture, and it shows you in pink the uterus and how it is moving away from its normal position. So let's take a look at this figure here with uterine prolapse. So in A, in figure A, you see that is a normal uterus. That is a normal uterus. That is how the uterus should lie over top of the bladder. Okay, again, we that terminology used, antiflexed. Uh, the next one there, B. B is considered to be a first degree prolapse of the uterus. So you can see how the uterus has moved from figure A to figure B. It is not lying over top of the bladder like it's supposed to be. It's now making its way down through the vaginal canal. So that is considered a first degree or what is called a mild prolapse. In C there, you see what is called a second degree, some, sometimes also referred to as a moderate prolapse. So you can see that that uterus is making its way on down through that vaginal canal. D, well, we've got major problems here. This is considered to be a third degree or a severe prolapse. Okay, again, the term I told you, procedentia, 
This is where the uterus is beyond the vaginal opening. And you can see there, it is beyond the vaginal opening. It is actually hanging outside of there. And again, that terminology is called procedentia. So those are the different degrees of uh, uterine prolapse. All right, so let's move on to what is called a cystocele. A cystocele is when the bladder has protruded into the vagina. So a cystocele is just where the bladder has protruded into the vagina. Okay, so again, a cystocele, the bladder has protruded into the vagina. And you have a picture of this. Okay, look over uh, on the opposite page of where we looked at the uterine prolapse, and you see some different figures there. You have A, B, C, and D. And with cystocele, you're looking up there at figure A, right? And we said again, this is where the bladder is displaced toward the vagina. You can see the arrow was showing you that displacement there. So the bladder is being displaced toward that vaginal canal. And look at the arrow. Now look at your box inset with B, with cystocele. You can see the bulge. Whenever um, a female has her gynecological checkups and things like that, um, the examiner can see that bulge. Okay, and you can see that bulge higher up there in the vaginal opening. So that is considered a cystocele. Now we're going to move on to what is called a urethrocele, and this is where the urethra has protruded into the vagina. Then we have a rectocele. Okay, the rectocele is where the rectum has protruded into the vagina. So rectocele, we have the rectum, it has protruded into the vagina. Make sure you know your terminology with cystocele and rectocele. So rectocele, the rectum is protruding into the vagina. So let's look back at our picture right under cystocele. With rectocele there, you can see in figure C, that rectum is protruding toward the vagina. The arrow is showing you that it is protruding toward the vagina. When um, a checkup is done uh, the female on the female, you can see the bulge. It is located uh, more uh, lower than what the bulge was for the cystocele in figure inset box B. When you look at inset box D, you can see the bulge is located uh, more inferior. So there is examples of cystocele and rectocele. Now the last one uh, we're gonna talk about is what is called an enterocele. This is where the bowel has protruded into the vagina. So we have uh, the bowel protruding into the vagina. Now, let's talk more in depth about a displaced uterus now that we understand all of this, okay? So when we think about a displaced uterus, uh, sometimes it can be congenital, it can be caused by childbirth. The normal uterus, okay, when we think about the normal uterus and how we look and see how the uterus uh, anatomically normally should lie, that normal uterus lies with the cervix at a right angle and it's to that long axis of the vagina. The body of the uterus is slightly inclined forward, okay? Again, uh, it's over the top of the bladder, what we call antiflexed. That's A-N-T-E-F-L-E-X-E-D. I don't know if that's on your test or not. I don't think it is, but it's just terminology, antiflexed, okay? So some Terms that we need to be familiar with that are used to describe uterine displacement include retroversion and retroflexion, okay? And I have placed pictures uh, on the slides after this slide that shows you uh, the difference between retroversion and retroflexion, okay? So make sure you look at those slides. All right, so with retroversion, this is when the uterus is slightly aligned with the vagina and it points toward the sacrum. Okay, so that's retroversion. Retroflexion is when the uterus is flexed even further backward. Okay, and just make sure you look at that slide so you understand what retroversion and retroflexion is. It has something to do with the uterus. Okay, when the uterus is aligned with the vagina, okay, and then it's pointing toward the sacrum. So it is pointing toward the sacrum. Retroflexion is even worse than retroversion. Retroflexion is when the uterus is flexed even further backward, okay? And again, this has to do with displacement of the uterus. Now, things that the patient will complain about, backache, uh, muscle strain, 
They might have a leucorial discharge, which is like a thick, whitish discharge. Um, they might feel heaviness in the pelvic area. They tire very easily. Our treatment for displaced uterus is something we've already talked about. It consists of pessary placement. Again, remember those pictures we looked at on that slide. That is what we're talking about right here, pessary placement. So they use a rubber or plastic uh, donut-shaped ring. Uh, it's placed in the vagina, and what is it doing? It's propping up the uterus, okay? So that's what it is doing. Um, a pessary is just providing support. That's what it is doing. It is providing support to the uterus, the vagina, the bladder, or the rectum. Um, for pelvic heaviness issues, um, it can also be used. Uh, they are changed every three to four months, and it can actually, the patient can actually be done, uh, be taught to do this themselves, or it can be done by the healthcare practitioner. So again, pessaries need to be taken care of. Uh, they need to be changed every three to four months, and it can be done by either the patient or it can be done by the healthcare practitioner. All right, so let's talk about the patho of what we're talking about with prolapsed, when we're talking about uterine prolapse or a prolapsed uterus, it's the same thing, okay? So we've talked about displaced uterus, now we're talking about uterine prolapse or a prolapsed uterus. So the patho, uh, a prolapsed uterus is considered mild if the cervix drops uh, to the lower vaginal segment. It is considered moderate uh, when the cervix is visible at the vaginal opening. And then we have severe prolapse, also known as what we already talked about it, procedentia. That is when the entire cervix uh, and the uterus can also protrude from that vaginal opening. And we already looked at those examples. Okay, we already looked at that. Uh, some contributing factors to uterine prolapse include things like uh, obstetric trauma, overstretching of the uterine muscles, multiple births, coughing, straining. It can be due to the aging process. If a person, if a female has had a history of lifting a lot of heavy objects, and of course, estrogen loss due to menopause can lead to uterine prolapse. My clinical manifestations, the patient complains of feeling like something's coming down. That is a common thing that you will hear patients complain of. Females will say, it feels like something is coming down, okay? That is a common complaint. Uh, dyspareunia, uh, dragging or heaviness in the pelvis. Uh, they might have backache, bowel and bladder issues. They might suffer from stress incontinence. Medical management, um, we're gonna just talk about a couple of these real quickly. They may have to have a vaginal hysterectomy. Okay, that's possible where you remove the uterus through the uh, vagina. Uh, if the surgery cannot be performed, they might use pessaries. Uh, they're utilized, again, for uterine support. Again, once they're inserted, it holds the cervix uh, in the proper position, keeps everything where it's supposed to be anatomically. When pessaries are placed correctly in the vagina, the woman is unaware that it is even there. Uh, she should have no difficulty voiding. There should be no difficulty um, having intercourse. Nothing should be affected. Again, every three to four months, it needs to be cleaned and replaced by the patient or the healthcare provider. Uh, the healthcare provider is the route I would go because the cervix needs to be assessed for signs of irritation. So I think it's more safe for healthcare providers to do this myself. Because if pessaries are not cared for over extended periods of time, problems uh, can occur like erosion. Okay, so we're talking about cervical erosion. Fistulas can form, okay? They also have an increased chance of vaginal carcinoma. So I believe it's much more safe for myself. If I had a family member who had to have a pessary, I would want a healthcare provider to be removing that and inspecting the cervix uh, every three to four months because you yourself cannot see that. Okay, so moving on. We're going to be talking about cystoceles, okay, and rectoceles. So when tissues, ligaments, and muscles are stretched and weakened due to things like childbearing, uh, multiple births, cervical tears, 
the organs move into other positions. And again, we've already talked about cystocele and rectocele. Those are the two main ones. And we looked at the pictures, okay, of what is going on with that. So you have all this relaxation of tissues, muscles, ligaments uh, of the bladder. And this causes the bladder displacement, okay, which occurs into the vagina. And remember, that is known as a cystocele. So again, I better make sure I know cystocele and rectocele. Cystocele is my displacement of the bladder into the vagina. Rectocele is when the rectum moves toward the, the posterior vaginal wall. Okay, again, it's all due to the relaxation of supporting tissues that occurs. And again, we've already looked at the pictures of those. Make sure you look at them again. That can help you learn better. All right, so what are my clinical manifestations? Now, with a cystocele, okay, a cystocele, so the bladder is displaced in the vagina, uh, what are we going to see? This is extremely important. With a cystocele, we are going to see things like urinary urgency, frequency, and incontinence, pelvic pressure, fatigue, okay? Prevention of completely emptying the bladder. This causes a perfect medium for bacterial growth and infection. So this female is going to be high risk for UTIs with a cystocele. So let's say this one more time. Very importantly, with a cystocele, I'm going to see urinary urgency, frequency, incontinency, pelvic pressure, fatigue, and also there is the prevention of complete emptying of the bladder, which predisposes my patient to an increased chance for a UTI. Rectocele, okay? With my rectocele, the rectum is moving toward the posterior vaginal wall. What are, going, what are going to be my clinical manifestations with a rectocele? Constipation, rectal pressure, hemorrhoids, a feeling of heaviness, okay, in the rectal area. Medical management and nursing interventions. Surgical repair. Sometimes you will see this called an A&P repair. Uh, other times you will see it called an anterior-posterior uh, colporophy. Okay, that is what that's, that's what we're talking about right there. All you need to remember about that is it's just a surgical procedure uh, to repair a vaginal wall defect. We don't need to know all of the, how, how it's all done and, and worry about that. Just know with the surgical repair known as an anterior-posterior colporophy, that is just a surgical procedure that is repairing a vaginal wall defect. Sometimes it's referred to as an A&P repair. My nursing interventions and my patient teaching, pre-op, this uh, includes ensuring a clean operative area with the administration of cathartics to accelerate uh, defecation, things like mag citrate that may be followed by enemas, uh, a liquid diet 48 hours prior to surgery. They may also have a cleansing vaginal douche that is given the evening before or the morning of surgery. Post-op care, I'm going to assess my vital signs. What am I watching for? Hemorrhage. Hemorrhage. Bright red bleeding. Hemorrhaging. How am I doing that? Well, not only am I going to look for it, okay, but I'm also assessing my vital signs closely. Okay, watching for that blood pressure to drop. Watching for that pulse to increase. Watching for a decrease in urinary output. Things like that that we've already talked about. Uh, Foley catheter insertion. Uh, to keep the bladder empty. Again, we don't want to put pressure on the suture areas. Stool softeners, uh, a small amount of vaginal bleeding will be noted, and that is normal. But we're watching for increases in vaginal bleeding. Okay, We're watching closely for that. Encourage early ambulation. Avoid prolonged standing and lifting heavy objects. That's a big no-no. Avoid sex until uh, healing has occurred, which usually takes about six weeks. Okay, so here's the example that I told you about the uterine layers when we were talking about endometriosis, and we were talking about the endometrial tissue that appears outside of the endometrial cavity. And again, we said that is just that membrane that lines the uterus. So you can see with the uterus wall layers, you have that endometrium, and again, that is the tissue that is appearing outside of the uterus. It should not be appearing outside of the uterus. It should stay in the uterus. It shouldn't be outside uh, on the colon, uh, on the fallopian tubes that you see there, or the ovaries that you see there. 
Okay, so when that happens, that is endometriosis. That endometrial tissue is appearing outside of that cavity right there. So you can see the different layers. You see the endometrium, you see the myometrium, and you see the perimetrium. So that is an example of the uterine wall layers. All right, so here's the slide we were talking about uh, with displaced, with a displaced uterus. We were talking about retroversion versus retroflexion. Okay, again, with retroversion of the uterus, this is uh, where the uterus is aligned with the vagina, and it's pointing toward the sacrum. So you can see there uh, in that picture the example of the retroverted uterus. That is a retroversion right there. And it's showing you all the other anatomical uh, areas. It's showing you the pubic bone, the bladder, the uterus, the rectum. You can see the sacrum back there as well. Um, and then on the flip side, we have the retroflexion, or what this slide says, a retroflexed uterus. It's the same thing. So with the retroflexion, you have the uterus. It's flexed even further backward. Okay, And you can see how further backward it is flexed in this slide. And uh, you can see there it says the uterus is squishing your poo. So they're going to have problems, major problems, with a retroflexed uterus with constipation.